So what is the first dream of every seed? To be a seedling. Let's look at the, their biology. John Harper, in his well-known book about plant population biology, published in the late 70s, called Seedling Establishment a series of deterministic events in which the scale of heterogeneity is determined by seed size. And if you think about it, many seeds are produced that never become a seedling, only if they reach what's called a safe site do they have the opportunity to get established. The safe site is the zone that provides everything the seed needs for establishment, the stimuli required to break dormancy, whatever they might, that kind of dormancy the seed might have, conditions suitable for germination, and resources, light, of course, water and oxygen. And also, of course, seed predators should be absent or at least have missed that seed that's going to germinate. So there's two main reasons a species may not occur in a given site or a given vegetation in a certain place. There might be no seeds of that species present or there may be no safe sites for that species. So Harper's approach uses scale, the scale of seed size, measuring the environment around it, looking at the microtopography of the surface of the soil and soil particles at the scale that's relevant to the seed. There have been a number of interesting experiments that show how variation in seed morphology influences how well seeds germinate in different microsites. And seed size and shape are both correlated with success in germination. If we compare two grasses, brome grasses, Bromus rigidus and Bromus madratensis, one, rigidus has larger seeds, madratensis has smaller seeds. Rigidus had straight needle-like awns. These are these things that stick out like little bracts in the grass infructescence. Bromus madratensis awns are curled. Consequently, in nature you find seedlings of rigidus on soil that's very smooth, and madratensis establishes on rougher soil. So some of these heterogeneities we've been talking about before, polymorphisms in seed size, or maybe plants that have two distinct sizes of seeds, they, this could be interpreted as adaptation to life in an environment that's heterogeneous at the site of seedling establishment. So by having different sizes and shapes of seeds, there's more probabilities of establishing a new plant. The wind-dispersed seeds, actually not only wind-dispersed seeds, a number of seeds have dispersal structures, tufts of hairs, little hooks, whatever, that influence germination. In many Asteraceae plants of the sunflower family, for example here the Akeen, or the, the fruit of a dandelion, with the pappus, this set of bristles, these appendages hold the seeds away from the soil somewhat. And doing an experiment, you can see which angle of seed germinates the best. And it turns out that if you remove the pappus of all of them and then place the seed part at different angles, the highest percent germination is achieved at the natural angle. One experiment looked at the weedy plantain, not the kind that we eat platanos, but the plantago, by preparing a seed bed of sterilized potting soil compost and dividing it <clears throat> into four replicate blocks each of the blocks received a bunch of different treatments, placing a glass plate flat, placing a glass plate vertically, 
making depressions, etc. And the seeds were sown uniformly over the four blocks, <clears throat> and different species tended to occur in different micro sites. Lanceolata was found where the deepest holes were. Media grew around or under glass. Probably those areas stayed warmer and moister. And major grew in the undisturbed area. So in nature, this experiment demonstrated that the abundance of any species in nature is governed by microenvironments. Or maybe not any species, any species of plantain. So I realize we haven't yet looked at the anatomy of a seed. Most seeds have a seed coat on the outside known as the testa, the outer layer that encloses the embryo and endosperm. The endosperm is nutritive tissue and the embryo, the, shown in green here, this little seedling, and the embryo itself has the radical, the primary root, the thing that pokes out of the seed first when it germinates, the hypocotyl, the area below the cotyledons, that's this area, and the cotyledons here. This must be a dicot. It has two cotyledons. The other thing to point out here is the caruncle, which is where the seed attaches to the ovary. And I think Hmm, I think I can't really tell where it is here on this picture. So there's two ways seeds germinate, either keeping their cotyledons above the soil or at the surface or below the surface of the soil. So this is called epigeal germination, where the part below the cotyledons elongates and the cotyledons are lifted above the soil. And in this case, usually the cotyledons are green and photosynthetic. Hypogeal keeps the cotyledons in the soil so that the first photosynthetic part is the epicotyl above the cotyledons, the stem and the leaves. In monocots like grasses or corn, the cotyledon is single and has a hostorial tip, meaning absorptive. <clears throat> it elongates from the base, but keeping the tip in the seed can still take nutrients. So here's a diagram showing these different kinds of germination. The bean is epigeal. The cotyledons end up here above the soil. The pea is hypogeal. And so you never see the cotyledons above the surface of the soil. They stay below. These are two different um, plants in the same family, the legume family. So it doesn't seem to be taxonomically aligned necessarily. And then here's a monocot, a corn. The radical, note the radical, the primary root, these are not corn, but that's the first thing to come out when a seed germinates, and the same here. The coleoptile is the new shoot coming up. As the cotyledon, actually, and then the shoot rises above that. This doesn't show how some grasses may come up like this and then lift lift up. Sometimes I see onion seedlings like this with the little seed coat still on the tip of the growing monocotyledon. Certain plants have their seeds germinate while still on the parent plant. And one prominent feature of our local landscape that does this is the mangrove, the red mangroves as shown in this picture. So up here, this is the fruit, and then it's just germinating. A little tip is poking out, but then these get long, and this is elongated hypocotyl. Actually, it's not a root, but people call it a root. 
and it it lets it well we call these germinated seeds or, or fruits mangrove propagules so they can be carried around in the water and poke into the ground and then from the part that pokes into the sand roots come out and a, a new little mangrove tree can grow. Deborah Rabinowitz did an interesting study in the 70s and 80s correlating propagule size with distance from shore and ma red mangroves have the biggest propagules and they're in the deepest water. It's important to remember for mangroves that what's dispersing isn't a seed really but a tiny tree. So there are lots of plants whose seeds don't germinate right away and people have wondered how long do seeds last. One way to age seeds is with radiocarbon dating and water lotus seeds have been found to be more than a thousand years old and still viable using the tetrazoleum test when you cut the seed and stain it if it turns pink that means it's viable but better proof I think is germination and an interesting study was done in California taking seeds from the inside of adobe bricks these are made of clay which of course would have or made of soil compacted which would have seeds of the plants around there so biologists took bricks from old Spanish missions and well, actually, they took the seeds, which were extracted by archaeologists, and the botanists tested them for viability and also germinability. The minimum age of the seeds was determined by the known dates of construction of the buildings. The seeds, of course, may have been in the soil longer than that. <clears throat> so these were probably more than 200 years old, at least, and two of the 40 species taken out had seeds that germinated. The botanists grew plants from these. Ten of the species had some viable seed by tetrazoleum stain. So seeds in the soil are what we call the seed bank of a species. And Robert Cook, a professor at Harvard, was the first to make life tables for seeds. He postulated that instead of dispersing in distance, in space, they were dispersing in time. If seeds last more than a year, this can buffer a species against hard times in the future. If some year is too hot or dry or whatever for the plant to reproduce, still there are seeds to germinate when the time is right. Um, probably for most species, records of how long seeds last aren't that important. But for some species that occur very sporadically or after major disturbances, the seed bank can be very important. <laughs>